<laughs> commercial grade. Corporate worship is obviously not what we imagine corporate worship would ever look like. If you had told me three months ago that there would be a semblance of this, I would not have believed you. So uh, obviously we submit under the sovereign hand of God for however long he chooses to do this. But I, when I say I'm happy to see you, I mean it. it it's good to see you. We love you. We pray for you often. And we can't be together in worship. So thank you for coming this morning and for joining with us so that we can hear God's word in person, fellowship with one another, and enjoy uh, the fellowship and being together of the people of God. I do want to thank, I see several elders and deacons here, your help over the past few weeks getting all of this together, all the planning that went into it, all the work. Thank you, uh, Ava and Nancy, for you coming to those services so you can play for us. Very grateful for that and for God's many mercies. The only announcement, oh, I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We'll continue do, doing this uh, as we are in this season of adjusted worship. So welcome. Thanks for joining us online. And we're very welcome that you are with us. What, what we've elected to do as a church is to hold two services, one at 830 and one at 10. And so if you're worshiping online with us and if you haven't uh, returned yet, that's fine. And when you decide to return, just let me know so we can uh, figure out which service to fit you in in order to keep our crowds the size they are. Thanks for being with us online. Just reach out to me uh, when you choose to return. And of course, folks, if you didn't see it when you came in, the offering plates are in the narthex, and you can drop your offering in either of those on either side. And 
or when you go out. Okay, that's that's all. That's all I think I have to say. You'd think if you do two services, you'd be sharper at the second, but I just feel like there's more to keep track of, and my head's already spinning. But grateful you're here, and we have gathered to worship God, to hear his word. Worshiping online, it, it can be family worship, it can be private worship, those are good things. But the worship of the New Testament is corporate and body worship. So while this is different and that causes us some lament, we are thankful we have this. So let's hear God's word. I want to read Psalm 65 that focuses on God's provision. Uh, and then I'm going to pray. After I pray, the ladies are going to give a musical offering. And then we'll come to the reading and preaching of the word. So let's hear Psalm 65. Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sin, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. You form the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength. Who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns or evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water, you enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges, you soften it with showers and bless it. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Then I will ever sing in praise of your name, and fulfill my vows day after day. Amen. Let's pray. Let's stand in adoration for a moment. This great God. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your many mercies towards us. And indeed, often when we pray, often when I lead in prayer, I'm, I'm very conscious of what you have done for us as the people of God. And we thank you. We give you thanks for what you do. Father, make us mindful of who you are, that there ought to be time in our prayer where we simply adore you, thank you for who you are, when we invoke you, call on your name during the invocation and ask for you to be present with us and to bless us with your own self. That is what we need more than anything else. And so, God, I thank you that you're a God worthy of worship. You're a God worthy of praise. You are a faithful God. We read here of us fulfilling our vows, and we will. And yet you were first faithful to us when we were unfaithful. And it is of your very nature to be righteous and just and to be merciful gracious. So I thank you for the, the picture of God that we're given in the scriptures and the, the many facets of your being, your attributes. Uh, as the lady said months ago, Lord, who you are and how you've revealed yourself and all the glorious goodness that we see when we stand in adoration of you. You're a God who answers with prayer. You're a God who forgives sin. You're a God who chooses, elects, and brings people near to you. You do great an awesome deed. You make all things and you preserve them. And especially as this psalm has emphasized, you provide for our needs. So thank you, Lord, for providing for us as your congregation. Thank you for providing the chance to be together this morning. And give us ever-increasing wisdom and a sense of your will that we would know how long to do what we're doing, that we might honor you. So thank you for providing what you've given us. Thank you for the many mercies. Christ. We do pray, even as we call on your name here at the beginning, that you might bring these adjusted seasons to an end speedily. We lament it. It's different, and it's different in a way that keeps us from doing all the things that your word puts before us for worship. Just give us wisdom and grace to know how long this will continue to trust you. And in your hand, we ask that it might come to an end soon. So, Father, remember those in need, and again, as we gather here in your presence, thank you for the people of God. Thank you for you who are with us. We pray these things because you are a good God and you're the Father. And you reign over us from heaven. And you have a holy name. I pray you'd make that name holy among us, that you'd sanctify us. That your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
You give us our daily bread. You forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And you keep us from temptation and deliver us from evil. We adore you because to you belong the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now the ladies are going to play for us a musical. Mm -hmm. Turn with me this morning to Daniel chapter 9. The Old Testament scriptures, Daniel chapter 9. Last week we looked at the first half of this chapter, and today we will look at the so that, there we go. We'll look at the second half of this chapter today. So Daniel chapter 9, and I'll be reading verses 20 through 27. Daniel chapter 9, your, your bulletin mentions the pastoral prayer here, and I'll, I'll put that with my prayer at the end of my sermon, just taking a moment to pray for our congregation as a whole and our needs, particularly in light of his word. So Daniel chapter 9, and let's look at verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. Then as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word, and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue unto the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, 
He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed poured out on him. Amen. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, please give us understanding. Please give us insight. Please give us understanding of the scriptures that we might be able to read them with profit and benefit from their message. Lord, you, your word says that the entrance of your word is life. So, Lord, in that life, help us to understand you, to worship you, to make the right response to you, to get the word, so to speak, that we need to hear. Or we long to grow spiritually. We're, we're hungry and thirsty spiritually. So speak to us wherever we particularly need it. Help us in a good application of your word. And as we deal with this text, that is somewhat complex. Lord, help us to understand it. And help us, of course, to see Christ and his redemption as the highlight of your word and what you are doing in time to rejoice in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is full of examples of people who ran out of time. In Noah's day, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and took them all away. That generation ran out of time. Matthew 24 tells the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, or bridesmaids. You remember that? Some had oil and were prepared for the wedding. Others did not. Because they had to go out and buy it, they arrived late to the wedding, and they were denied admittance. They were too late. James 4, you ever walk up to someone and say, well, we'll do this, Lord, Willing. Maybe you say that, or someone said that to you. Comes from James 4, where, where James is saying, Look, biblical wisdom says when you make your plans, factor in the will of God. We'll do this if the Lord wills. And that is what will ultimately determine your time. And so Ephesians 5 counsels us make the best use of the time because the days are evil. You see, I think as humans, we tend to assume that we have more time than we do when we really don't have as much time as we think. So as we come to this passage in Daniel here today, it says a lot about time. Now, all of Daniel has been talking about time, but this one even more particularly, we're starting to get frameworks of time in the passage that we are coming to today. It gives us information about events from Daniel's day up until the coming of Christ, and even on into eternity. So it is a passage about prophecy and future things, which I love to study in, in scriptures, and love that when I was a first Christian growing up in, in a Baptist uh, church, where there's a lot of prophetic preaching. I still love prophetic preaching now as a Presbyterian. I love it even more. I trust we'll enjoy looking at this text together with prophets. But what's beautiful about this passage is not simply, hey, it's about end times and it's exciting things, but also because its focus is on Christ. The whole point of giving us time here is to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is doing in time for the glory of God and the salvation of his people. Time centers around the work of Christ. And so my appeal to you then from this passage today is just to think about where do you stand in relation to the God of time? Where do you stand in terms of whose side are you on in history? Not thinking in terms of anything social or political, but ultimately with God. Are you in line with his times and his purposes for time? When time is up, will you have used your time well in his service? Rarely good to be late. I was conscious preaching of the first service of, you know, when the first one ends and then you've got another one coming and how are we going to work that all out with time? You don't want to be late, but when it comes to eternity, you certainly don't want to run out of time. So are you on time with God? That's the question this passage puts before us today. Are you on time with God? And we can answer it by looking at four important times that the verse is referring to. So first, there is a time to pray. Last week, we talked about Daniel's prayer of repentance. Remember, he repented of his sins and the sins of his people. And the reason he repented was because he had been reading in Jeremiah that the seven-year exile is going to come to an end. And so he was going to ask God to mercifully end the exile. 
Therefore, he repented and he asked for God's mercy. He thought, based on Jeremiah, based on the events around him, okay, this time is coming to a close, and it drove him to pray. Well, today's passage, beautifully, it contains God's answer to that prayer. Daniel, or God answered Daniel's prayer, and the verses we've read today are the answer. So it furnishes us with assurance God answers the prayers of his people. In fact, both verses 20 and 21, they make the point, while Daniel was still praying, the angel Gabriel appeared. The angel that he had seen before in the vision of chapter 8, this is the angel who would later appear to Zechariah and Mary and announce the births of John the Baptist and Jesus. Here he appears to Daniel. He tells him in verse 22, I was sent to give you insight and understanding. I've come to reveal information to you. Now, what's interesting, or here's, let me say it like this. Here's the main point that I want you to see for now. When was Gabriel sent to Daniel? Verse 23 reads, as soon as you begin to pray, a word which went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. We kind of get a little peek into heaven's throne room, don't we here? When Daniel's prayer came up, so to speak, the word from God went out. And Gabriel was dispatched to give Daniel an answer to his prayers at the very moment he began to pray. So as we'll see in a moment, God did much more. God's going to tell him much more than he even asked for. But we see here at the very beginning, God answers prayer. And often God will do much more than we ask or imagine. Now, what's interesting about God's answer, and then this is what we'll unpack in the later points, but what's interesting about the answer is it's going to go way beyond the situation Daniel prayed about. In other words, Daniel prayed about the 70-year exile, and God's going to tell him about some things that go way beyond the end of the 70-year exile. Daniel was thinking about the immediate future, and, and that's okay, because that's all he knew based on reading from Jeremiah. But what God's going to tell him goes way beyond the future. But God's going to tell him more than he asked for. But at the same time, I want you to see this. God is going to tell him about some things that were beyond what he asked for. In other words, Daniel prays for the future, but God says, I just want you to see what I'm up to ultimately. I, I want you to see my big purposes for time and for eternity. And so what I'm, what I'm driving at, friends, is when you pray, believe that God answers prayer. And when you pray, realize God can answer bigger than you expect. But also realize when you pray, God may answer different from what you expect. Because he has an ultimate purpose he's pursuing. And I think we do well if we keep all those together. Don't think he doesn't care about your circumstances. He does, and he will answer prayer. And at the same time, if he answers differently, don't view that as God not caring, not being involved. Look, what's he up to big time? Because this is passage shows us God answering in that way. And the last thing I want to say just before we leave the point about prayer, I think we should ask the question, why did God answer Daniel's prayer at all? According to verse 23, Gabriel tells Daniel, you are highly esteemed. In other words, in God's eyes, Daniel was highly favored. God answered Daniel's prayer because God thought a lot of Daniel. Now, why did God think a lot of Daniel? Is it because he prayed a lot, because he was so brave when he faced lions and other things? Not ultimately. Ephesians 1.6 makes this statement. God has freely given us grace in the one he loves. In other words, the grace you've received comes to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God loves him, God loves you. Because he was faithful, God considers you faithful. Because he paid for unfaithfulness, God considers you forgiven. And so because you're connected to Christ, God highly esteems you and highly values you. So when God says through Gabriel, Dan, you know, you're highly esteemed, it's because Daniel's connected to the one who is ultimately highly esteemed in God's eyes, his own son, Jesus Christ. And so here's the good news. That's how God views you if you are connected to Jesus Christ. He says you are highly esteemed. 
And on that basis, he will answer your prayers. So there is a time to pray, friends. Secondly, there is a time to save. And here I am thinking of God's purposes to save. Now, what we're going to do is verse 24 gives us the big idea of those purposes. That's what we'll look at right here. Verses 24 to 25 fill in the details. And what, what you're going to see in verse 24 is a general time frame and a big purpose. All right? So first, the general time frame. Verse 24 says, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city. There's your time frame. Seventy sevens have been decreed. Now, the number 70 gets to us because of Jeremiah's prophecy. Remember, the exile would last 70 years. That's what Daniel is praying God will end and fulfill. But when the angel Gabriel appears, he tells Daniel about a period of 70 sevens. And it's going to go way beyond the end of Israel's exile. So what are these 70 sevens? Well, all other translations other than NIV use the phrase 70 weeks. And I think that's a very faithful, formal translation that gets the point across. We're talking about a 70-week period. But the NIV uses the phrase 70 sevens because, as we'll see in a moment, Gabriel appears to be referring to 70 groups of seven years. If you did the math just there, it'd be a 490-year period. So you get that general framework, 77, but not necessarily 70 weeks, you know, like a year and two weeks, or, or that's bad math, a year and a month, but 70 groups of seven years. And then we'll see why that is the way it is in just a moment. But there's your general time frame. So then what is God doing in that time frame? Verse 24 says, these weeks will finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. In other words, when these 77s end, when they're completed, then God's saving purposes will be completed. When the 77s are up, God has finished his purpose of salvation. And that means what? Sin comes to an end. Transgression is finished. Wickedness is atoned for. Everlasting righteousness is present. All the visions and prophecies are sealed up, which means they're confirmed. They're fulfilled. They're not sealed away. They're completed. And the most holy place is anointed, which is probably a reference to pure, restored worship. So when, again, when the time period ends, God's purposes end. Now, living on this side of the cross, we can see some of those things already taking place, can't we? When Jesus came, he atoned for wickedness. He accomplished the salvation of his people. But at the same time, we don't see some of these things fulfilled, do we? Sin isn't ended. Everlasting righteousness isn't present. We understand from the New Testament those things will happen when Jesus comes again. So here's what I'm getting at. These 70 weeks, they're going to be fulfilled in two phases. And the text itself will suggest that. We'll see that when we look at the details. But again, just big picture. If this is all you get, big picture is this. When the 70 weeks end, God has accomplished his saving purposes. Sin is gone, and his people worship him. And so here's the question I would ask you. Details or not, are you in line with that purpose. Do you realize sin is your greatest problem? You want to know what the greatest problem is? Look at what all the solutions are focused on. What does God focus time on? Solving the problem of sin. That is, that you, you may have other problems that are very important and present. I'll deny that for a minute. But at the end of the day, our ultimate biggest problem that we have to solve first and foremost is sin. And that's what God is up to in time. And if you wonder, by the way, how it relates to the end of exile, why was Israel exiled? Because of their sin. And so when Daniel prays, Lord, end the exile, forgive our sins, God comes and says, oh yeah, I'll talk to you about ending the exile. Let's talk about the big exile. Let's talk about the biggest problem 
facing humanity. That exile 70 years that happened to that one group of people, that's just one manifestation of the punishment of sin and time. Let's talk about the biggest problem that could flow over into eternity. Exile, that is separation from God. That is what God is solving in time. And that's, by the way, what Jesus came to do, to end your exile. And you can benefit from his work. And I, and I would say, do so before you run out of time. All right, let's look at the third time. A time to die. Here we're going to get into the two phases. Because verses 25 through 27, they, they fill in the details. And the first thing they show us is a time to die. And I think we're talking about here as when Jesus dies. Now, bear with me. This is where the passage gets a little tricky. I'm going to do my best to explain. I, I love this kind of passage. I want to make it clear. I want to make it applicable. But what I would say is, is if it's clear or not, we can study it more. But let's still try to make the application clear. But let's look at these details. I think they help us read God's word well. The rest of the passage gives us the breakdown of the 70 weeks. They're going to be placed into three groups, but really we're talking about two periods of time. And each period of time revolves around a main character, a good guy and a bad guy. So verses 25 and the first half of 26 give us the first period and the first main character. Look at verse 25. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. So you've got two groups. You've got seven sevens. You've got 62 sevens. I think here we add them together and we get 69 sevens. That's your first period of time, the 69 sevens. And who does this group of time revolve around? This anointed one. According to verse 26, he will be put to death and have nothing. And I'm going to interpret that as a reference to Jesus, the Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. So the first 69 weeks, this is the period of time from Daniel's day until the first coming of Christ when Messiah was put to death. Let me tell you why. What starts this 69-week period? According to verse 25, it starts when the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, that's a reference to Israel ending their exile. You have the Persian ruler that says, okay, all the Jews can go home. And then they said, and you can all rebuild your temple. And eventually they said, you can rebuild the city walls. Read Ezra and Nehemiah, the events you read about there. That is what verse 25 is referring to. The word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. It says it will rebuild, be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Remember, there was some opposition to the temple. There was some opposition to the walls. But ultimately, they prevailed, and Jerusalem was restored to a certain extent. So that starts <clears throat> the 69 weeks. And I'll say this, too. There's some disagreement on the exact event that starts it, but all of them, no matter which one you look at, whether going home or the walls, they're all in the same general time period. Now, when does the time period end? Verse 26 says, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one, Messiah, will be put to death and have nothing. So this anointed one, whom we're taking as Jesus of Nazareth, he will be put to death and have nothing. He'll be cut off for the sins of his people. Now, again, you get a little disagreement on the year Jesus died. Was it 27 AD, 30 AD, 33 AD? But here's what I'll tell you. No matter where you land on the starting date, and no matter where you land on the ending date, the period of time is always roughly 483 years, or 69 times God was giving Daniel a framework that would start in his day and terminate with the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of those dates, by the way, if you say, well, I'm going to start with this starting event and this date of the crucifixion, it is exactly 483 years. Others, it's right there in the ballpark, which works with biblical numbers. From Israel's restoration 
until the death of Jesus of Nazareth, you have roughly a 480 year, 83 year period. Now, let me just say this. That is great evidence, is it not, for the Bible's trustfulness that God revealed the future to Daniel and that he was correct in what he revealed. And therefore, the Bible is God's word. You can say, as some do, well, it must have been written after the fact. Somebody just wrote it up history and disguised it as prophecy. There's a big problem with that. When does this time period end, the first chunk, with Jesus and Nazareth? Who did Jesus refer to in his preaching on the Olivet Discourse? The prophet Daniel. Jesus already knew about Daniel. A lot of people in his day and before knew about the prophet Daniel. So it already existed in that day. You couldn't have written it up later. It already existed. So I would say especially to young people, but to the whole congregation. You know, God's word can be trusted. There's good evidence for its trustworthiness, apart from that we take God at his word. And by the way, if you're wondering, okay, why, why is the split here? Seven and 62. It could be the seven are the first events, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, 62 is the coming of Christ, so you've got a near event, a far event. But however you cut it, the first 69, Daniel's day to Jesus' day, and the dates are right on the money. So all that to say this, what is God doing in time? He is providing salvation for his people. What is the high point of this revelation? What's it all driving towards? The anointed one being cut off for his people that you're like what is god doing in time things around me are crazy with work with this virus with economy with societal relations what is what is going on god is pursuing saving purposes that's what he's always up to and so the question we ask ourselves are am i in line with those purposes am i benefiting from the purpose god is giving you time are you benefiting from it and here's the last time period we'll look at and the last question i'll ask the time to judge. Verse 27 focuses, or the, the end of verse 26 and verse 27 focus us on a time to judge. What happens after the 69 weeks? I think historically we can see that the first 69 weeks have been fulfilled. They came to conclusion when Jesus was put to death. What next? Well, the second half of verse 26 reads like follows. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, <clears throat> and desolations have been decreed. All right, here's your second main character, this ruler whose people destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, if we're right that the first 69 weeks take us up to Jesus, then I am inclined to look for the fulfillment of this last week around the time of Jesus, particularly something that involves the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. And we have a very strong candidate for that event, the destruction of Jerusalem that took place under the Romans in 70 AD. They destroyed the city and the sanctuary through war and desolation. In fact, verse 27, give us further warrant to view it that way. Look at verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. All right, here's our last seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. All right, so follow me here. You've got a 69 weeks to take us up to Jesus. One week's left. And we are told here that at the midpoint of that week, this ruler sets up an abomination and ends public worship. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because we spent four weeks talking about it when we went through Mark 13. The Olivet Discourse that we took as being fulfilled, or at least I took as being fulfilled, in AD 70, Jesus said, you'll see, you disciples will see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. So this figure that Daniel anticipates here in Daniel 9 is referred to by Jesus, and we interpret as that as taking place in 70 AD. And you may be wondering, well, wait, 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 wait. I thought the abomination of desolation, that was the, the Judas, the, the, the Antiochus Epiphanes, who persecuted the Jews and the Greeks. Yes, he was. 
Some passages in Daniel refer to him. Other passages refer to 70 AD. Jesus refers back and forth because what he is saying, look, those two events are so similar, they get the same name. And so here, Daniel 9 highlights a destructive event that takes place around the same time as the death of the anointed one, the Messiah. So 69 weeks, Jesus dies. And then you've got half of the 70th week in which Jerusalem is destroyed. And by the way, the siege of Jerusalem leading to its destruction took about three and a half years. Okay, if you're still with me, here's the last thing I want you to see. Look at the beginning of verse 27 again. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seventh. In the middle of the seventh, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So the final 70 gets cut in half. The midpoint is this destructive event, which I'm taking as the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That fits the time period of the first 69 weeks. You might be wondering, though, but what about the last half of the week? When is the last half of the 70th week fulfilled? Well, in the New Testament, there is one book that refers to a three and a half year period. Do any of you want to make a guess as to which one this is? It's the book of Revelation. Listen just to these references. Revelation 11.3 reads, I will appoint my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days. I did. I checked it at home. Three and a half years. If you take 360 days, the Jewish way of reckoning on the calendar. Revelation 12, 6 reads, The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Revelation 12, 14 reads, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time. If a time is a year, time, times, half a time. Three and a half years. Last reference, Revelation 13, 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemy and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Once again, three and a half years. Now, I'm not going to preach the whole book of Revelation here in the final point. We went through it on Sunday nights a few years ago. Here's what I'll say, and I'll give you Revelation 12 and 13. If you want to study those, that will, that will tell you whether or not I'm on the right track. Here's the question we got to, we got to answer, right? Revelation says there's a three and a half year period hanging out there. When is it fulfilled? I think if you look at Revelation 12, it makes the argument, what starts the final three and a half years, the second half of the week, the event that starts it is the first advent of Jesus Christ. His birth, death, and resurrection kick off the final three and a half year period. What event ends? The 70 weeks. When does that three and a half year period come to a conclusion? I think based on Revelation as a whole, the return of Christ ends the final three and a half year period. Now you're thinking, I can do math a whole lot better than you. It is not three and a half years from the first and second coming of Christ. You're absolutely right. What Revelation has done is taken that final three and a half years, the last half of Daniel's 70th week, and pulled it out like an accordion and said it's going to last between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. That might be a little different from what you, you've heard before in other contexts. Sometimes people talk about a future seven-year tribulation. They get that from Daniel 70th week. But I think we see in Daniel itself, we're not actually looking for a 70th week. We're looking for half the week. Revelation never refers to a seven-year period or a full week. It only refers to a three-and-a-half-year period. And it starts it with Jesus' first coming, and it ends it with his second coming. In other words, friends, now is the time of the tribulation. Now is the tribulation. Now is the kingdom. It won't last three and a half or seven years. It will last until Jesus comes again. That's why John opens his letter by saying, I, John, Revelation 1-9, I'm your partner in the suffering, the tribulation, and the kingdom 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that's a lot of detail, especially like first week back, right? It's like waking up with a cold shower, okay? Here's what you can all take away, whether or not you, you agree with all the details. What ends the 70 weeks? Well, we can answer that question by asking ourselves, what happened to that ruler who set up the abomination that causes desolation? And the end of verse 27 tells us, until the end that is decreed is poured out on him, in a word, judgment. That is the ultimate end of all who oppose God, judgment. Antiochus Epiphanes fell to God's judgment. The Romans who invaded Jerusalem in 70 AD fell to God's judgment. Disobedient Israelites and Gentiles in the history of the world have faced God's judgment. All the beasts in Revelation, they'll be judged. And you and I, every person in this room, will be judged. How do you escape judgment? By resting in the one who is judged. Remember, the anointed one, the ruler, he was cut off. Doesn't look like much of a ruler, does he? But the ruler who comes and is powerful and oppresses, well, the end's going to be poured out on him. There was a ruler who was cut off for you, so you would not suffer the wrath that will be poured out on all who oppose God when he arises on the last day to judge and to call all people to account. So friends, don't be late preparing for that day. Don't be part of the forces that oppose him. Everything that you need to do to get ready for that day has been done through Jesus Christ. So be on time. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you reveal the end from the beginning. We thank you that you govern all things so that your purposes come to pass perfectly and always in the right time. We adore you and praise you for that. Father, we take a moment to, to admit our sin. We, we do not use our time the best we could. We do not always think vigilantly with, with a view to the return of Christ. We sin at times, and that is not how we would want to be found when our master comes. So Lord, forgive us for our sin. Wash us and make us clean. Thank you that you restore us, and that when you appear, because we are found in you, you will call us good and faithful servants. And that's only because of the goodness and the faithfulness of Jesus. So we thank you for that. We thank you for mercy. I pray for everyone in this room. They would be found in Christ on that day and acquitted, vindicated, accepted on the day of judgment. Thank you, Lord, that we can have confidence of that even now. You justify us. You declare us to be in the right when we trust in Jesus. I pray as our young people grow up, they'll cultivate that sense of trust in you and rest in you resting in your word, resting in your goodness. And I pray that we would be a people zealous for good works. You do call us good and faithful because of Christ, and yet you also produce goodness and faithfulness in us. If we are to bear fruit of our faith, while those works will be imperfect, you'll accept them as perfect. So make us a people zealous for good works, the kind of works that characterize your people. And forgive us when we fail. Thank you for forgiving us by Christ. And I do pray for our congregation. I do sincerely thank you. We could regather today. And while this gathering is different from anything we would have ever imagined, Lord, we pray that it might come to an end soon. You would speedily end the days of this, these adjusted circumstances. That you show mercy to our community and our city, our state, and our country. And that you would bless those who work to fight against this virus and that you would even give success. Pray for our leaders that they make good, wise a just decision, and that you show mercy. Give us better than we deserve, Lord. We deserve wrath, but Lord, show us mercy. Pray for those in our congregation that work uh, in the medical field or people involved with school and all the extra work there. Lord, bless them. Keep them safe. Pray for those who have been furloughed, who have less hours or no hours, that you would provide for them. And help us as a church to show mercy and to be an aid to those in need. I pray for Pam McGreevy and for Lady of the Maccabees, that you show her mercy as she may have little time and that you would grant her grace to trust in Christ and to live for you with whatever opportunities are left. Lord, thank you for our congregation. Thank you for our people. And thank you for our gathering. And now send us out with your blessing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me set before you God's promise. And then again, uh, we'll dismiss by rose. But, but this worked well. The first service basically...
once we get everyone going, people pretty much figured it out. So just watch your neighbor and you'll do well. But then we'll play a post loop and then we will go out and fellowship, say hi to one another. And thanks again for joining. So friends, hear God's promise for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And Bruce's and Fulmer's there. If you can fill it, you guys want to start uh, the Exodus, go for it. Friends, thanks for joining us online. Do it again next week.